Hello and welcome to this this month's uh, non-farm payrolls webinar on 6th of February, Friday the 6th of February 2015 with me, Michael Hewson, and my colleague Colin Szynski in Canada. And it's going to be Hi, our everybody. pleasure to walk you guys through um, today's or this month's non-farm payrolls data. And to be quite honest, I think it feels a little bit like an empty climax because we've been so focused on Greece this week that really we haven't really thought too much about what affects um, the non-farm payrolls number that we're going to get today out of the US will have, but also um, what effect that uh, the Canadian jobs report will have because there's definitely going to be a little bit of push-pull on um, on on those numbers, particularly on the dollar Canada, which has been absolutely hammered um, over the past few months on the back of the weakening oil price. Um, but for the time being, you know, let, let's 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 sort of, let's let's look at um, what we're expecting first and foremost for non-farm. So I'll bring my Bloomberg up, and um, we can see the numbers right in front of us here. Now, hopefully, all you all you guys can. Can, can see my Bloomberg here. I'm going to make the window as big as possible. So basically, we've got the expectation here, and changing non-farm payrolls. Bloomberg are expecting around about 228,000, which is obviously down from the December number of 252. Um, the unemployment rate is expected to remain unchanged at 5.6%. Um, but I think the main focus this week is less about um, the actual headline number and more about what the average hourly earnings data will be. Now, there is an expectation here of a rise in average hourly earnings of 0.3% and the year-on-year -year number to rise to 1.9%. Now, if that's a weak number, then I think there's potential for the dollar to sell off. And I, I, and I know you and I have talked about this before, Colin, haven't we? Um, you seem to think that we will still get a U.S. rate rise this year. We just might see it at the back end of the year. Um, whereas, whereas I'm of the opinion that we won't see one at all. So, uh, if you'd like to expand upon your reasons, um, I, you now have the floor. Uh, thank you. Yes, I do still think that the uh, the U.S. will uh, raise rates back up to probably. I'm now thinking about one percent by the end of the year. They could do that by three quarter point increases starting in September. Uh, originally, there's been a lot of talk, and even through this week, from uh, various Fed members about. Not only when are they going to start raising interest rates, but how are they going to do it? Um, that one scenario I had thought of was that if you started in June, you could do a quarter point increase every other meeting. So there's, there's two scenarios you could follow. Some members say start raising interest rates and do it slowly, and some members say, well, let's just hold off and do it more quickly later. So I think that's a battle we could see play out among different factions within the Fed over the course of this year. But so you, so you think see, the U.S. economy is strong enough to withstand a rate rise when everyone else is cutting? At this point, yes, they do. They have been going the wrong way. The question is, how long is that going to last? And, and what happens with the U.S. dollar? I mean, so far, the U.S. dollar has moved up enough to – basically does do the equivalent of a couple of interest rate increases here. Does it continue to rise or does it come back off? I mean, if we get a low number here and the U.S. dollar will probably start to come back off, and then I do think you'll see it at least push out to September. Okay, so let's let's look at the numbers because we we saw the GDP number last week. It's 2.6%. We saw yesterday's trade deficit numbers, minus $46 billion, which suggests that um, – you know, external exports remain fairly weak. But more importantly, let's look at the retail sales numbers over the course of the last, say, quarter. They've actually been negative. If you actually look at these numbers here, and the consumer confidence has been rising, retail sales have been falling. Now, next week, we've got U.S. retail sales for uh, January. And they're expected to decline again, yet consumer confidence is at 102.9. You know, for, for me, Colin, we're talking about the data and you're talking about consumer confidence, but all the data we've seen thus far suggests to me that inflation is falling and, um, you know, we're just not getting what I would suggest is the actual, you know, the actual, um, w w we're seeing growth go in the opposite direction. Yeah, I know things do seem like they're slowing here. That's why it's funny. I find it interesting when all the Fed members come out this week and are still saying that uh, that they're on track and they still want to do it. I do have to admit, I think they're going to go later. I don't, I'm not convinced that uh, that they're going to go as uh, as soon as they've been talking. And yes, the numbers are slowing down. I think though they will focus more on the uh, the ex uh, 
the X energy numbers, so we probably want to focus on those. But I, I'll be honest, even core inflation has been a bit soft lately. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I looked at the prices paid on manufacturing um, this week, and it dropped to 35 you know, as well below expectations. Um, mm -hmm. We look at the employment components of non-manufacturing, it dropped to 51.6 from 56.5. You know, um, you look at what the, what's happening with respect to the oil price and the likely drag back of, or the drag down effects on that. Um, you know, I suppose it's really a question of, you know, how, how much of a time lag you think you'll get on, on these oil price declines going forward. I think so. Yes, and also on that, Michael, the, the time lag between the um, like the hammock effect where you have the, the sharp drop off in, in, in employment and prices at the beginning with the oil price crash before it ignites the rest of the economy, there, there could be, a, it, it, it's a matter of how long does this lag take before it, uh, the positive effects work out. They do, they are, there is a delay, and, mm. and that's probably going to impact also how long it takes for the Fed to raise rates because at some point, um, historically, these crashes, it's, it's a, uh, it's a short-term negative, but it's a long-term major positive for mm. stocks and for the economy. I mean, I think you have to put the unemployment rate in the context as well of the participation mm -hmm. rate. Yes, here absolutely. In the, UK, in the UK here, we've got um, a fairly low unemployment rate, but we've got a very high participation rate. In the US, you've got a very low participation rate and a low unemployment rate. And I think the more important rate is the underemployment rate, which is 11.2, which, which is hardly budged. You know, they talk about a tightening labor market. Well, I don't see it. Um, I still think there's a significant amount of slack there. And, the, you know, the Fed does have an inflation mandate, and they're missing it by a mile. You know, they're missing yes, it by right. a mile. And the headline numbers are going to – well, the head, and certainly on the headline numbers, they're going to be uh, – they're going to be low for a while, and probably for a year with this, uh, as the oil price works its way through. Okay, so let's let's look at some charts and look at some of the key levels because I think this is basically what I think um, you know the guys on here want to look at. And certainly looking at the S and P, we're right on the top of that right shoulder. It's around about 2068, 2070. So I think really what we've got to think about here is what would a good number first and foremost do with respect to the dollar, but also what does it do with respect to the stock market? With the stock market, I think we're in a range. The bottom of that range mm -hmm. is highlighted by this series of lows that I've linked through here and the 200-day moving average at 1975. If we get a good number, will that actually be stock negative because of the fact that it might br potentially bring a rate hike nearer? I don't think the actual headline number is the important number here. I think that the important number is the participation rate and the wages data. So what may yeah. happen is you may you may get a fairly good headline number, which will be you know fairly positive from an econ economic point of view and a dollar point of view. But you might get a very weak average earnings number. So what will happen is you'll flick between the extremities of the range. I certainly don't think there's an awful lot of upside left in U.S. markets, earnings notwithstanding, simply because we haven't really had some earnings that have been particularly good, Boeing and Apple notwithstanding. Obviously, we had LinkedIn and Twitter last night, which were fairly good. But, um, you know, it's not been – it's been fairly unremarkable, I would suggest. They're not huge burn burners in terms of earnings, and the guidance also has not been, uh, has not been overwhelming either. Perhaps one thing we can mention on the headline number, the, the, mm. what we've been looking at for a long time, the sweet spot, 200,000 to 250,000. Over mm. 250, the Fed has to raise rates sooner, or below 200. They ha they'll probably go much later. You and I, Michael, have, are both below the street. We're both down in the, the uh, year 205, and I was 210. And mm -hmm. uh, both of us have been factoring in a slowdown on uh, related to the oil layoffs in the oil and gas sector. Yeah, I think that's right. I think we'll get a weak number because of that. I mean, that also sort of ties in a little bit to um, my dollar weakness theory, because if we look at mm -hmm. dollar weakness, I think this is where it feeds in. We've had a breakout on cable. Got a breakout on cable around 152.80. I don't know whether you've, you've seen it. We've got what I would call a potential double bottom breakout or a potential breakout on a triangle. We've broken higher. Um, now, potentially, now that we've broken above 152.80, which is which is essentially our breakout level here. This is a four-hour chart I'm looking at ladies and gents, and you can see it here. I've drawn a blue line through the highs here, but I've also drawn a horizontal line through here. Now, irrespective of how you measure that, I think as long as you stay above 
this black line here, which is around about 152.60, 152.70. If you measure this up, this puts us at around about 155, 156, which is these series of lows through here. Um, so potentially, I think over the course of the next few trading sessions, we could actually see further dollar weakness. Well, how are we going to get that? You know, are we going to get that through a weak headline number, or are we going to get it through a weak wages number, or are we just going to get it naturally because of the nature, natural positioning of the market? I think, I think a lot of stuff that – go on. I'm sorry. I, was going to say, I, think, I think the U.S. dollar, regardless, had gotten way overextended here and was overdue for a correction. It was overextended against – pretty much everything and we're starting yeah. to see the rebound we're seeing the well the incredible volatility with basically a, a stabilization a rebound in crude oil we're yeah. seeing it in cable we're seeing it in in the euro bouncing up off 111 to closer to 114.15 we're seeing the uh, even the US dollar cad has, has come back off a little bit off its high yeah, let's so have a quick I think it's a, a, quick look at that a natural rollover but a soft employment number could accelerate that Let's have a look at the dollar CAD because I think this, yeah. this, is, this is actually a nice little pattern here. Can you see that? We had a bit of a top hip pull in here. We've got a potential bearish engulfing here. It's not quite a key reversal day, but it's pretty close. And we've got what I would suggest is a bit of a neckline around 123.60 mm -hmm. on the, on the, on the daily. On the so, so it does look as if it's starting to roll over. Let's look at that on a weekly. And again, look at that. So that could actually be potentially very interesting on the dollar Canada if we break below 123.60. We could actually get a, a, a pretty good a pretty good sell off there. So I certainly think, ladies and gentlemen, it's worth keeping an eye on that. Also, can I just the, add on that, Michael? Yeah, go on. On, on the dollar, on the uh, Canadian jobs, uh, I think Canadian jobs are going to get hit even harder than the U.S. jobs on the uh, on the oil patch crunch. And uh, and so I was looking at uh, negative 15,000 on that. The streets at plus five. Plus five, it's right here, yeah. Yeah, and I'm looking. I, I put, I posted. Uh, my guess is negative fifteen. Okay. What about, the was negative 10. what about the unemployment rate? Tick up to six point seven, six point eight. Six point seven eight, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye on that. We'll keep an eye on that, and um, have a quick look at euro dollar before we get to the um, numbers. We're still two, just over two and a, just under two and a half minutes. The euro dollar is slightly different. Again, this is a four-hour chart, and we're pushing again once against the limits around 115. But we can actually see that, you know, potentially we are we are starting to trend and squeeze a little bit higher. I think what we do need to do is break above this 115.30 area. Mm -hmm. But again, in my weekly video on Tuesday, um, I suggested we might get a squeeze to 117. Now, whatever you think about what's going on in Greece at the moment, you know, you could argue it's euro negative. You know, undoubtedly, you know, it is. And, but I don't think we're going to get any form of color on that for at least a couple of weeks, which gives us, I think, a little bit of what I would call scope to squeeze higher on euro dollar and potentially squeeze back to this series of highs just below 117, around about 116.80. And certainly if you think that the pound is going to go high against the dollar, then you've really got to think that potentially it's going to go higher against the euro as well, if not as much. But certainly I think any, any dips in euro dollar, you're probably going to find a few bids around the mid 113s um, if, if we get one. Um, otherwise, you know, you know, whatever, whatever the number is, I'm still slightly dollar bearish, um, only because I think the market is so one way in terms of being dollar positive that any, any, any sort of rally in the dollar could well see a, a little bit of profit taking. And we've got a similar sort of thing on the dollar index here as well. Um, a significant area of support around about 93.56 if we make that a weekly chart. Again, we can see that on the weekly chart. It does suggest that potentially we could be building up for a bit of a sell-off. Um, could you put up a, an RSI or a stochastics on that, Michael? Do I have time to do that? We've got 43 seconds. What was that, dollar uh, index? Okay, don't worry about it. We'll show it later. We'll show it later. It's supposed um, to say the RSI and the stochastics are rolling down too on that. Right. Okay, so let's just, I'll just quickly put one on there. Yeah, it is. Okay. it's got way overbought and it's rolling down. It's, it's rolling down. It's I mean, it's about, almost at 50. So. Yeah, it's all up, almost at 50. Okay, so yeah, basically, let's, um, let's, um, we've got 15, 15 seconds. seconds. So I'm going to pull my Bloomberg over to here so you can see all the numbers as they come in. Whoops, hang on a second. And hopefully, we'll get some color in three, two, one, and go. 
Two five wow, seven. Wow! Look at our revision, Look at that though. Revision. Look at our revision. Three two nine. Look yeah, at our three two nine to December. Huge. Wow! That is massively dollar positive. But the unemployment rate's ticked higher. Five point seven percent on the unemployment rate. Let's look at the average earnings numbers. Two point two. Oh my word! Look at that. So that is massively dollar positive. Massively dollar positive. That number. So let's go. Yes, that's um, what a surprise. big uptick in inflation. And that's even with high, losing high-paying jobs in the oil sector. Yeah, it is. So basically that, that blows, blows my theory out of the water. So now really it's a question of where do we, where do we go from here. Certainly I think euro dollar is going to test lower. So it basically brings us back to what I was saying earlier about the mid-113s as being a support area. And look, that's where we are. It looks like we're heading back to this line down here. Looking back on the cable, I think there's certainly potential for us to come all the way back to this this area of resistance well what was what was resistance is now support around about 152.60 and maybe even down to 152 I certainly don't think that we're going to get um, a significant rebound today in cable or euro dollar on the back of those numbers the market is going to want to test the appetite for pushing the dollar higher I think this afternoon unless you unless you have a different view but I think on that basis that we're, we're going to want to see what the appetite is for pushing the dollar higher let's have a look at dollar yen because I think that's quite interesting as well dollar index gonna, is speaking. yeah of course it well it would do uh, it would do so we've got dollar yen again here you've got but it's a pretty muted reaction, to be quite honest. On that sort of number, I would expect dollar yen to be an awful lot higher on the back of that, given given how how sensitive it is to the bond markets. You know, and and, and if and a number like that is going to make you think, well, surely a U.S. rate rise is sooner rather than later, which should push yields up, and dollar yen should react to that, and it's not reacting to it. So let's see if the um, US 10-year note has been sold aggressively on the back of that. And yeah, it has. Look at that. I mean, that's a massive, that's a massive sell-off. So that basically, that for those of you who don't know, and I'm sure most of you do, yields move inversely to prices. So a sharp sell-off in the US bond market will basically push yields higher, um, and as a result, interest rate expectations. Uh, bring forward interest rate expectations as well. And certainly there's potential for a little bit of a topping pattern there. Let's look at the Canadian jobs numbers, Colin, because I think that could be interesting as well. Um, so, so, the the Canadian was, so the headline number was really big, 35,000, well above the 5,000. If we break it down, though, look at mm. full-time jobs, it was a loss of, 11, of almost 12,000. So that's yeah, that one pretty there. much in line with what I was calling. And you're mm. looking at a 47,000 increase in part-time employment, uh, mm. which basically offsets that, that revised 46,000 increase from the previous month. So I right. think you've got some distortion in here from, uh, from part-time jobs. And, mm. uh, and actually, I'm surprised to see that considering that, uh, that we've got you know, Target shutting down. There were other uh, big layoffs announced in Canada during the month, even outside of the oil sector. So there's, maybe, there's some maybe kind there's of distortion a lag. there. Yeah. Maybe there's a lag. Because you yeah, also had the fact that... that because you also had the fact that Target basically was pulling out of Canada as well, and you would think that that would actually have a negative effect on the employment picture. When is that happening? Uh, the liquidation sales started yesterday, right. and uh, apparently already since they uh, since they put out the announcement, like absenteeism has gone way up. People aren't bothering to uh, to come in, even if they haven't actually been laid off. They're not really working there anymore, and uh, so you'll probably see that hit the numbers over the next couple of months. Okay. The participation rate in the U.S. has jumped from 62.7 to 62.9. So that's, that's an interesting number. Um, let's just close that down there. So all in all, I'm a fairly good set of numbers, um, certainly fairly dollar, dollar positive, and it certainly has affected the, uh, the bond market. Let's look at, let's look at Brent crude, because I was talking to that, I was talking about that earlier with respect to, to, to one of the clients and suggesting you know what to expect from that and i think there's i think there's potential for that to push higher on the back of those jobs numbers certainly positive in terms of demand relative to supply let's not forget also that we've had seven successive monthly declines and i think we're well overdue a, a bit of a pullback so you know from that perspective if we can break this high here that we saw 
um, earlier this week around about $58.50, then we could actually see a move higher in Brent towards around about $65 a barrel over the course of the next few trading sessions. Certainly we've got a significant area of support going through these, this area here just above $53 a barrel. So keep an eye on $53 a barrel. We're getting a little bit of a crossover on the two moving averages here, which are the 50 and the 200. So momentum is starting to turn positive on the four-hour chart, which would seem to suggest that if we get a break through this resistance level here, then we could go higher. But at the moment, there does appear to be a bit of a cap around about $58.50. And certainly there, is, there does appear to be a little bit of weakness. And maybe, given the fact that the oscillator is overbought, we could actually slip back first before we go up again. Certainly worth keeping on on that little bit of a, that little price range there that's starting to develop on the four-hour chart. Let's quickly go back to Dollar Canada for you, Colin, because I know that you want to have a quick, you probably want to have another look at that. It's been a pretty yes. neutral response, isn't it, really, on to, in terms of the CAD chart. But what would you say is the likely, what's what's the risk there that we go back higher or we 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 continue to drift lower? I think we're going to drift lower here, Michael. We had a uh, even with the um, the failure, or sorry, even with the U.S. dollar rallying, it popped up from. Uh, on my, I'm looking on a minute chart. It went from 123.80, popped to 125 even, failed at the 125 round number, and started to come back. That's actually a lower high than those uh, those three candles there at 126. So uh, and it's already starting to drop back. So uh, the, the, it took the worst that uh, the worst they could throw at it. And uh, and still couldn't even get through 125. So yeah, that's, uh, that's one telling me hmm. that's the, that's the one minute. So you see the spike down and the spike yeah. up, and uh, and now it's settling back into the middle again. But basically, hmm. that's like you know anything that the uh, that that cat that bears could throw at it, it took and still hmm. failed to the lower high and around number. And uh, and so that's looking to me like there's a, there's a pretty solid top forming in there. Yeah, it looks like it's pivot. It's sort of, it looks like it's pivoting around the middle of this moving average that I've got on the mm -hmm. chart here, which is round about 120. Hang on, 124.45, give or take. If I can actually leave the, keep the mouse still for long enough. Yeah, around about 124.45, give or take there. So. There's a bit of a pivot going on there at about 120, between 124.40 and 124.50. So certainly worth keeping an eye, keeping an eye on that there. Um, while you're listening, ladies and gentlemen, if there's anything, if there's any particular market you'd like me and Colin to have a look at on your behalf, please feel free to use the chat facility and um, sling a question over because you know this isn't just about me and Colin basically chewing the fat and talking about the markets. This is just as much for your benefit as it is for us. So just been asked about the US 30, so let's go and do that. And again, it's a similar sort of story, I think, with respect to the S&P. We're, we're pushing back against uh, these, these series of highs through 2015, January and, um, and the beginning of this month. Let's have a quick look through that there. 17,900. Yeah, between 17,950 and there's, there's certainly a barrier there, and um, you know, for me, we're still, I think we're still in a range here, Colin. I, I'm not really convinced one way or the other that we're ready to push to new highs or new record highs at the moment, um, because when you look at the earnings and you look at the strength of the dollar and you look at the potential for a, a rate rise, essentially what you're, what you're, what you're saying is, um, you know, how strong is the U.S. economy? to be able to stand, you know, to, to hold stock valuations at their current levels. You know, and I, I still think the jury's out on that. Um, I, certainly, I certainly don't think that, um, you know, we're seeing very, very jo good jobs growth. And yes, we've seen a fairly positive average hourly earnings figure, which, you know, is fairly positive. But will that in itself be enough to prompt the, you know, prompt the Fed to raise rates? You know, I'm, I'm still not totally convinced by one data point. Yeah, I still think they're going to. It just is a general long-term program of they, they they need to get interest rates at some point back up to one percent. I think just to give them some flexibility. I mean, the reason one of the reasons why you know, banks like um, Canada and Australia and and Norway has been able to step in and cut rates now the way they have over the last few weeks was because previously they had 
raise rates a little bit to give themselves some room to work with. So I think mm -hmm. eventually the Fed's going to have, they're going to want to do it just for their own operations. And, and yeah. I don't think a 1% interest rate would kill the United States economy. What would it do to the dollar? Probably run, run the dollar up close to 100. Uh, if yeah. the Europeans continue with their uh, QE, which you would expect. No, I mean, we're already at 94, yeah. 95. I think you could see mm -hmm. 100 even on that. Uh, let's say over uh, towards by now and the end of the year. Okay, I've just been asked about the FTSE 100, the UK 100, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, are we ready to break to new highs yet? Um, let's look at the let's look at the react let's look at the price action around the levels as we saw earlier this week. Certainly, there's still a barrier at 6,900. I don't think you know anyone can dispute that. Let's get rid of this line here. We don't need it anymore. Um, what we can do is stick this horizontal line in through here. 6,905 still appears to be that proverbial line in the sand. But even if we get above that, um, you know, 6,950 is the all-time high. What's going to take us above that? Is it going to be more stimulus in China? Is it going to be a rebound in commodity prices? Or is it just going to be straightforward QE from the ECB when they start printing next month. I think at the moment, we've still got a natural barrier at 6,900, but what I would say is that each subsequent dip here is starting to get a little bit shallower. You know, we, ha we had an early attempt this week to get above it. We failed. I think with all the uncertainty with surrounding Greece, you know, are we going to push to new highs? I think we'll struggle to get there. I think as long as we stay above 6,000, the longer we stay above 6,800, the more likely it is we will eventually push higher. But at the moment, I wouldn't stake my mortgage on it. Yeah, the 6,900 has been looking pretty formidable there. And then the, you did, there's an all-time high and 7,000 around yeah. number kicking in. So you're into that 100 point pretty serious resistance band there where you could peak above it but you may, may, may still take a couple of times before you get through. And I look at the stochastics. So on the one hand, if you look from the beginning of the month, you've got an, basically an ascending triangle forming of those lower, uh, higher lows, which is positive. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, you've got your stochastics overbought and rolling down, which is negative. Now, this is interesting looking on a, a four-hour chart. So there you've got higher yeah, lows. Four hours, yeah. It's a little better in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the stochastics and the momentum. It's almost a megaphone pattern. Is it a diamond? It, it is, isn't it? It looks yeah. like a megaphone or a diamond. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. There's certainly a bit of a, there's certainly something going on there, and uh, certainly worth keeping an eye on. But uh, I think it's here and people are trying to figure it out. Yeah, I think the market at the moment is trying to figure out which way to push this, but uh, it certainly does feel that the market is probably a little bit starting to get a little bit short so we could get we could get a spike higher through 6900 to 6930 35 the key question i think is what's going to be the catalyst to drive it through 6950 and i'm not you know i'm not sure what that catalyst would be given what's going on with respect to greece at the moment um i still think that there's potential for a massive accident uh, a grexit unless one side backs down. And at the moment, neither side looks like doing that. So it's really a question of what a potential impact a Greek exit would have on the rest of the markets. And that could be, you know, our next little black swan. Because so on that, Michael, do you think yeah. that, um, I mean, obviously, clearly we've seen over, over the last few years any kind of trouble in Europe has sent capital into, into things like gold. If mm. capital was to start leaving Europe, could that could some of it be finding its way into the UK, or is the UK too yeah. close for, to be no, able to behave? It, no, it's definitely it's definitely finding its way into the UK. Because yeah. if you look at UK gilts and and the yields on that, the yields are at the lowest levels that they've ever been. Um, certainly, with respect to gold, this is a little bit of a concern for me. The fact that we've rolled yeah, over and, back down. and it's coming back down. Um, below the 200-day moving average as well. So I think maybe there's a little bit more in terms of legs um, with respect to this gold price decline. Maybe we'll come back to 12.33. Um, I thought, you know, look at, look, at the, look at the declining highs here. 
you know, that doesn't really bode well. We broke to the top side. We didn't actually get to my minimum price objective. We got to 61.8% of it, but it does appear to be that, that we are now starting to trade lower. So if we drill down onto the four-hour chart, we can actually draw a line through the highs here. So for us to, we need to break this downtrend, and the only way that we're going to be able to do that is if we break back above 1275, 1280. And at the moment, we don't look as if we're doing that. We're in a nice little downward channel at the moment, and the momentum does appear to be um, pointing towards a slow decline towards um, this 1230 area that I highlighted on the daily chart here. So I think with respect to the FTSE 100, uh, the, the jury's out on that. We could, we could squeeze higher, but I'm struggling to you know, find a catalyst to really push us through 6,950. Um, certainly, I think that any short positions are going to start building up around 6,910. And I think for that reason alone, I think we could find dips well sought after. But what's going to be the extra catalyst to drive, drive us through that? I'm not 100% convinced about that. I, cer <coughs> I certainly wouldn't stake my mortgage on it. So is there anything else, ladies and gents, that you'd like us to have a look at before, um, before, we, um, before we sign off? I think we've pretty much – have we covered everything? I'm hoping that we've covered everything. Um, yeah, I think we've covered all the main ones, that's for sure. Well, I, think, I think we have, yeah. Okay, well, listen, if um, T-bond, so you want the 30-year or the, um, right, I'm getting asked a whole host of stuff now, crude WTI, T-bond short, okay. So you want me to do the 30-year, I'm guessing this is what you mean by the T-bond. They're probably going to be pretty much of a muchness because the yield curve is fairly, fairly flat in terms of U.S. markets, but... Uh, Again, I think you've got a similar you've got a similar you've got a similar layout through here. A nice little potential reversal pattern forming on the T bond. We look at that low there, or you could even draw a line through here. You could even argue that potentially we we've potentially broken lower on the uh, on, on the four hour. If we look at the technicals and the oscillators on the T bond. I'm gonna use my slow stochastic. It's one of my more uh, Accurate ones. Whoop, not that one. That one's just a little bit too sensitive. The slow stochastic I want. That's just too noisy, that one. Okay, so we've got this one. So, so for me, the T bond is, is near a key support level. It's been trading sideways, and at the moment, it does appear to be finding a little bit of support around about these lows, around about 148. 140, between 148 and 149. WTI is probably going to play out in a similar way to Brent, which I covered earlier. Um, not quite broken out of this downtrend that we've been looking at over the course of the past few months since the, since the end of September highs. Um, Colin, I can hear a lot of background noise. Can you, can you sort out your audio, please? Um, no problem. So we've got we've got a downtrend line here. We, yeah, it is potentially potential bearish 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 candle there. But the fact that we've actually broken above the highs of the last two days makes me think that until such times as we break above the highs that we saw earlier this week, the risk remains still for a little bit of a pullback on WTI in the same way that we have with Brent and. Um, um, before, before, before we potentially break higher, but uh, I certainly think that the risk remains towards the upside at the moment with respect to oil prices, simply because we've had such a long decline. All right, I'm getting asked. What else have I been asked? Let's see. We've got Nasdaq. Nasdaq. Let's look at the Nasdaq. There we go. For the last little while, it's been pretty range bound between. Yeah. Um, Yeah, again, 4, yeah, we're looking at that, and you know, you look at look at the line through the highs, still resistance through the highs, and we actually haven't got back above the January highs either. So, again, it's going to take significant effort, I think, to get back through these highs. 
So, so for me, with respect to U.S. markets, it's really a question of how much more upside is there relative to what we're seeing in Europe. And uh, I think, I think for me, yes, you can talk about the QE from from the ECB. How much of that is going to leak out? I think a lot of that could, will, could potentially leak out into the UK and, and the FTSE 100 simply because if you look at the FTSE 100 and, the, and its performance relative to the DAX, it's, it's underperformed quite significantly. So therefore, there's certainly much more potential for upside. But at the moment, it's going to take a significant amount of effort to get it through that 69.10 barrier. Okay. Right, well, that's, um, I think that's pretty much it, unless you've got anything else you want me to cover, Colin. No, that's great. I think we've really gone through everything well today. Okay, cool. Well, next week, we've got our analyst debates, which is on Thursday at 3 p.m. So if you want to join me and Colin next week on Thursday, you can just look it up on the, um, look it up on the uh, education section of the cmcmarkets.co.uk website. Otherwise, um, thanks very much for your um, company this month. Um, and if we don't speak to you next Thursday, we'll see you pretty much same time, same place in March, where hopefully we'll also find out what the next ECB rate decision is, but also um, find out whether or not that uh, jump in um, average earnings um, was a one-off or um, symptomatic of a new trend. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. And um, as I say, we'll post this on YouTube. Otherwise, we'll see you again next week. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone.